Behind the Mask, the podcast. Behind the Mask. podcast billboard top one that's the song that's the new hit song oh you think so it, yeah i do oh, Every time. I, i've heard I like it a few it. times now and yeah it's catchy it's catchy it's fun i hope it never loses that spark perhaps. plays in your head it does you shower in the morning and you get you hear the everywhere it'll the follow me everywhere yes song. maybe that's our new uh, goal song yeah i think so <laughs> i'll pitch it see how it goes hey guys welcome to a brand new episode of Behind the Mask. I'm your host, Gabby Allen, and I'm here with the star of the show, Dr. William. Oh, thanks for that introduction, Gabby. You're welcome. I was getting You're really the star you know what? of the, the show. Ca- the coffee also <laughs> hit me. Yeah, so we're kind of buzzing we're pretty hard right we now. We are. We are. But we're here. We're ready to talk about things, ready to learn. Uh-huh. And today, we're going to be talking about uh, tummy tuck complications. Yes. Because the more you know, the better you look. So let's dive in. Tell me, tell me about a tummy tuck. Well, I got my pen and paper because there's a lot to go through. Yes. And I don't like complications, but I love to talk about complications Mm -hmm. because I think they get overlooked when we're talking about plastic surgery. A lot of everything is glorified. And the way people look at complications and the way surgeons look at complications are two different things. So I think I want to just kind of start there. Like, yes. what do you think of when you think of a complication? Complications, first thing that comes to mind, especially I think from a patient's perspective, is scary. That's scary. scary. That's, but we're going to sh- we're gonna rebrand it to here's how we put safety first and avoid any preventable complications, right? So complications, I'm thinking things that can go wrong during surgery or maybe... Or after. It, or after and yeah. make the recovery not... What and was I, the plan? I think a, I think a lot of people look at complications as if something an error was committed mm-hmm. and something went wrong. Whereas as surgeons, we're very familiar with complications, and it's not as if something was done incorrectly. It's just a side effect of having that type of surgery. You can develop this problem. Mm-hmm. So all of these complications don't necessarily mean something was done badly. It just means that. Things are done the way they normally are. Things are done correctly, and then you can have a problem. So, I think that's important just to kind of lay that framework there. Mm-hmm. The other, th- the other way that I look at it, because you know, obviously, I've been doing surgery for many years. I say to patients or even family members about to undergo surgery or something, is I tell them you will have a complication. And that maybe seems a little bit odd, but what I mean by it is it, you, it's impossible to go through and, and have surgery and not have something go wrong. We just want to make sure they're minor complications, identify them, address them, and treat them. But w- the reason why I say that 100% of people have complications is it can be something very simple as having to start an IV the second time because your IV went interstitial, you know, subcut- subcutaneous. So it can be just a very minor complication, but, you know, they had to stick you twice or something like that. So it's always difficult when we're operating on humans to have things go just perfect without And uniform every single time. Yeah. Every person's different. Yeah. And nausea can be a complication, you know, things like that. So if you really include everything, uh, people are faced with these all the time. But so I specifically want to talk about tummy tuck complications. And I'm going to jump in and talk about the major one first. So the major complication you can have after a tummy tuck is a blood clot. And what a blood clot is, it's also known as a deep vein thrombosis. The thrombi is just a blood clot. And that can form, that can happen after any surgery. It's more common after like orthopedic surgery, for example. Um, And what happens is just from either during the surgery or immediately after surgery, because you're not up and active and because you're asleep during the surgery, your blood can pool in your legs and you can form a clot. And that clot in and of it by itself can produce problems with swelling, but usually your, you know, your body can handle that okay and it'll dissolve it. Where it really gets into a problem is if that clot breaks off and travels 
and goes up to your lungs. Mm -hmm. Now, thankfully, it's not very common, but that's kind of the dreaded complication. I've never had a patient that's had a blood clot that led to death, mm -hmm. but I have had patients that have had blood clots mm -hmm. before. But if they do flip off and they go to your lungs, that's called a pulmonary emboli. The focus that we have, so it's not common, but it's important to understand that, and that's why I wanted to start with that one. The way you prevent a blood clot, there's things that we can do in the operating room in terms of trying to give you more fluid. And we put uh, compression stockings on that patients wear that uh, helps with the blood return. And we use sequential compression devices, which, or we just call them SCDs, which are like little calf massagers. So you wear that during surgery, and that'll help with um, the blood supply, uh, blood return. So those are the things that we precautions that we take during surgery. After surgery, we um, give patients blood thinners, mm -hmm. and so they start that um, on the day of surgery. But the most important thing in order to prevent a blood clot is, do you know? I don't. I can't come up with anything. It's walking. Oh, yeah. So Walking. Yeah, so something totally simple. So simple. I walk every day. And take my hot girl walk. You guys take a hot girl walk. I see on your Instagram. Yeah, hot girl walk stops about. the blood clots. That's the yeah. slogan. Oh, I like that. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, so it's walking. So it's really simple. And I think sometimes what happens is, you know, as humans, when we know there's a pill or a shot or a medication or something we can do, then we focus on that as being the treatment. And, okay, well, that's how I'm going to prevent my blood clot. It's helpful. The, the blood thinners are definitely helpful. I use them. I prescribe them. But what's more helpful is frequently walking. And so you don't have to go on a long walk. It's just around your bedroom or to the bathroom. It's not depending on how far you walk, but how frequently. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's really nice to know is that there's a very simple solution. And so it's another reason why I think you know having ambulatory surgery, outpatient surgery, you go home the same day, it's kind of like a tough love because if you have surgery in, let's say you had a tummy tuck in a hospital, you start off in the preoperative area, you're mm -hmm. in a stretcher, you get an IV, they wheel you to the operating room, you shimmy from the stretcher to the bed, then we move you from the bed to the stretcher while you're still asleep, you get wheeled to recovery, you get wheeled to your room, you're not walking. Right. With outpatient surgery, it's like tough love. <laughs> You get off the operating table and it's like, good luck. Yeah. We're, we're like, <laughs> all right, get out of here. Walk home. Can't drive, though. <laughs> so, no, but, I mean, and it, it is, it's, it's tough love, but it's really helpful because we wheel you to the yeah. recovery room, obviously. But then when it's time to go home, then you're in a, you get put into a wheelchair. And now you're making you're making me laugh here because sorry because I know like like I'm taking a wheelbarrow and dumping somebody out or something. <laughs> That's not that tough love. No. Um, but you know you get gently transferred to a wheelchair. Gen Emphasis on the gently. And then, um, but you're forced to have to get up out of the wheelchair mm -hmm. and get into your car. You are then forced to have to walk into your house. You have to walk to wherever you're going to be recovering, whether it's, you know, the living room or your bedroom or whatever. You can go upstairs. That's a question I get all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so that tough love is really good because it's you're getting up and you're walking. And you compare that to someone who's in the hospital. Let's say they still have a catheter in their bladder mm -hmm. and they have a pain pump. And it, that's really nice. Like if I had a tummy tuck, I'd want to have a catheter in my bladder and have a pain pump and lay in bed and not do anything. Yeah, but make it portable so I can bring it home, right? But, <laughs> yeah, that's that's not allowed. But, you know, that's not good for you yeah. because you're not walking. And so having outpatient surgery is really good. So ambulation is the way to prevent a blood clot. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's the, main, that's the main risk factor or the main uh, potential complication. Then there's a whole host of other complications that would kind of be some minor, some more minor than others, mm -hmm. or less minor, whatever makes more sense. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to kind of start off with some of these. Stop me if um, you know you want one of them, or <laughs> or you're, you have more questions. So a very simple one is something that we call spitting a stitch, and what this is, this again, not just with uh, tummy tucks, but with any type of surgery. But it's more common to see it in a tummy tuck just simply because the incision is longer. Okay. So if you have a breast augmentation, you know, the incision is, is very small 
There's not as many stitches. You have a tummy tuck. It's long. There's more stitches, more likely to happen. And what that is, is your body's saying like, you know what? I don't want to stitch anymore. And so it can kind of work its way out a little bit and present to the surface. And we, and we call it either spitting a stitch or a stitch abscess. Now, abscess is like a horrible word. You know, you hear abscess, you think bad things. But this is like curable with just removing the stitch. Oh, okay. So it's this is not something that's going to have you admitted to the hospital. Mm. This is just a little stitch. But if it pops out, you would have the patient would have to go have it removed. Like it's not going to just kind of, it can't just hang out. Uh, it it actually can. Oh, just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Let your stitches hang out. Let them hang low. No, I mean you would come in and we would remove them. Hang but them from the ceiling. Let's say okay. if you if it just happened mm -hmm. uh, and you were not able to get to medical care, the stitch your body really is just going to take care of it. Oh, okay. And and spit it out. Um, so that's something minor. The a dehiscence. Wait, is, let me let yeah. me. You say what they are, and I'll try to guess okay, what I think good. it is. So what's right. this next one? Dehiscence. Dehiscence. Wound dehiscence. W whoops. Wound dehiscence. Uh -huh. Okay, off top of my head. Wound dis. What was it again? Dehiscence. Dehiscence. Mm -hmm. Oh, this one's really not giving me anything. Wound is okay. So the wound yes. is doing something it's not supposed to be doing. Yes. It's. It's not supposed to be hissing. Yeah, I don't know. I'm only getting not snake. Supposed to be de -hissing. Snake is the only thing coming to mind. Okay, there's nothing to do with snake. Okay, well, I'm glad. It's just separation. Okay. So something dehisses that's just separating. So wound dehiscence, and there's various different levels of wound dehiscence because if you can imagine an incision, there's different levels of the incision. So there's when I do a tummy tuck, I close the incision with three levels of sutures. So a deep level, or I use a big, thick suture, that's really carrying most of the load, the weight-bearing load, the strength is coming from that deep layer. Then I use another layer in the deepest part of the skin called the deep dermis. And then I use another stitch that's finer for just to kind of bring the skin together. Okay. And um, so you can have kind of a dehiscence at any one of those levels. And the most common is to have just a minor separation of the two skin edges. So the wound is a little bit open, but we're talking millimeters. Okay. Not serious. That just heals by itself. Your body okay. knows what to do. And then you can have different, different levels, and sometimes you can have a little bit more gaping along that incision. Now, why would you have some dehiscence? Well... You have to remember everything that we do as plastic surgeons comes down to blood supply. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of like vascular surgeons in some way in that we really understand where the blood supply is to the body, but we have to disturb the blood supply in order to accomplish what we want to accomplish. Like you can imagine if I'm doing a breast lift, I'm gonna have to move the nipple higher. Well, you can't just magically move it. You have to, alt you have to cut around it. By doing that, you jeopardize the blood supply, but you know where the blood supply is so you can safely do it. Mm -hmm. But we're still compromising the blood supply so there can still be healing issues, you know, with a nipple and areola. Same thing is with a tummy tuck. We're completely changing the blood supply when we lift up the skin and the fat. And so now when you sew everything together and you're relying on those two skin edges to heal, and if your blood supply is not what it used to be, you can have like a little separation there. Okay. So... And, and the other thing, too, is it can come from uh, movement, you know, post-surgery. We want you in that kind of bent-over position after okay. a tummy tuck. And um, if patients are a little bit more straight, they can exert more pressure on that incision, you know, kind of stretching it. Mm -hmm. And that can lead to a little bit of a dehiscence, too. Does the separation of the skin, does that then cause or play into the stitch spitting or the spitting stitch? Um, well, not exactly. Okay. But you can have exposure of a stitch when... From the separation. Yeah, from the separation. Okay. And but they're not... They're not they usually okay. related. And the reason is, is with a st with when you're spitting the stitch, there's usually a little bit of bacteria around that stitch, and so that's kind of what's causing your body to sort of push Rejected. out and open. Mm -hmm. And whereas when you have dehiscence, the wound is open, so the, that pus cannot accumulate mm. there. Um, okay, another uh, another thing to talk about, a little bit more serious than a wound dehiscence. So mm -hmm. a minor wound dehiscence is really not very much of an issue. 
doesn't create any long-term problems and doesn't, you know, if it's minor, it doesn't even really affect your scarring. Mm -hmm. You can have more significant blood supply problems, which is what we call ischemia or necrosis. Necrosis just means something has died. And in this case, we're just talking about the skin of the fat. And so you can have an area that develops more, it's, it's kind of like the dehiscence that we talked about, but more full thickness. Mm -hmm. So not just that little upper edge of the skin that come apart, but actually it goes down deeper and you can get a larger wound from that. Oh. Yeah, so obviously you'd rather have dehiscence than, in, than necrosis, but it's possible you have necrosis because uh, again of the blood supply. That will develop into a wound, so that takes more care to look after that but it doesn't really require a lot of fancy treatment. It just requires good nutrition, so you're feeding your body the things that it needs to heal, and time, and you have to keep everything clean. Oh yeah, and that's super important. I'll let your body heal. Mm -hmm. um, something, uh, so, seroma. Do you know what a seroma is? I'm about to. <laughs> so, seromas are common with a lot of different types of procedure, and it's the most common complication actually after a tummy tuck. Okay. And what a seroma is, the way I explain that to patients is, there, when we think of like the fluid moving around the body, there's f blood that flows in the artery, and then that goes into a vein, and that goes back to your heart. That's the general kind of movement of blood. But the role of blood is many, many things. One is obviously transporting oxygen, but the blood is always all, uh, is delivering nutrients to the cells. So the actual things have to leave the blood cells. And there's another system called the lymph system, you know, lymphatics. Like if mm -hmm. you get a cold or something, you've got mm -hmm. like a lymph node under mm -hmm. your, under your, behind your ear or underneath your jaw. So... What can happen then is, or what normally does happen, is the fluid will leave the blood cell, leave the, the artery or the vein, and it'll travel, it'll go into the cell, it'll help the cell, and then it'll take like products that you don't need anymore after metabolism that'll go back in the blood. So the lymph is this kind of fluid that's in the body that allows things to kind of move around, and it plays roles in immune responses and all that type of stuff, which is why you get the swollen mm -hmm. lymph nodes. It's kind of like a little battleground mm -hmm. where germs and your, your immune system are fighting. And so what happens with that fluid is it's in the little in between the cells and in between the blood vessels, but there are actually the lymphatic vessels that are, you really can't see that take the fluid back to the heart. And so it's another fluid transport system of the body. Mm -hmm. It's not as big as the arteries and the veins, but it's there. And when you have a tummy tuck, you disrupt all those little lymphatic channels, you know, as you lift up the skin and the fat. And the analogy that I use is kind of like you have a bunch of bridges crossing from, you know, one side to the other. Mm -hmm. And that's what's returning that fluid. And then when you have a tummy tuck, it's like all of those bridges get bombed. They're oh, wiped okay, out. Okay, okay. So they don't know. They don't have a path or they're the same path. So there's anymore. no path. Wait, we have to take the detour now. So the, the, everything accumulates. Mm -hmm. And so that, that fluid will build up. And that's why we leave drains. So drains stay in there. And when your body is not able to handle all that fluid, the fluid comes out of the drain. Is that the leaking that immediately follows? And that's from, if you do lipo, I don't use drains during lipo, mm. I leave everything open. So mm -hmm. that's, yeah, part of that okay. is lymphatic fluid. Part of it's the fluid we put in as well. Mm -hmm. But um, so we leave a drain during a tummy tuck to handle that fluid. And then when your body starts to rebuild all those little bridges, the amount of fluid that's coming out in the drains goes down because that fluid's able to get back across that bridge and back to your heart. But when we take out the drains, you can still sometimes get a seroma. So we look at the drain outputs. When the drain output's low, it means, oh, your body's handling this, the bit bridges are rebuilt, everything's fine. But sometimes still, even afterwards, you can take out the drain when the output was low, but you could still develop a seroma, which is just this fluid collecting. And it looks like a fluid wave. Like if you push on the tummy, mm -hmm. you get like a little swelling there, and then you'll see like the water in there. Oh. It's just clear plasma fluid. Okay. 
And so that we have to um, remove, and we just usually remove that just in the office with the needle. Okay. It goes through the skin and just remove that fluid. Is there discomfort cu- coupled with that, or is it just something that you notice and just has to be removed? Or is this like the patient would be very aware if they had this? Yeah, kind of all of those answers are correct. Oh, okay. For some people, it bothers mm-hmm. more than others. Okay. Sometimes patients have come in. What if it's not addressed? Um, well, let me answer part one okay. of the question. That's fair. And if they don't, so sometimes patients won't even notice that they have fluid, and I'll see them like, oh, you have some fluid here that we need to remove. They're like, oh, I didn't really notice that. Other times, it's there's more fluid there, and it can put pressure, and so patients can come in and go like, hey, this is like tense, and, and this doesn't feel good, and I think I've got fluid here. Um, or that, what was the two part? What was the I second? know, you know, as soon as I said it, I was like, shoot, he hates the two parts. No, but what is the two it. part? I forgot the second part. Um, it was, does it have to, what if it's not removed? Like what uh, if yeah. they don't have the fluid taken so, out, if it, they, if it doesn't give them that level of discomfort and it's just never addressed. Yeah. So it's, if never addressed, uh, I will say it is probably always addressed, oh, okay. um, because patients will eventually kind of see that it's taken away from their appearance. Mm. But I've definitely seen patients not from tummy tucks, but from other types of plastic surgery. When I used to do reconstructive surgery and and move the big muscle in the back, the latissimus dorsi muscle, and you move that, and then you can, sometimes patients don't notice they have fluid on their back. Oh, okay, that makes sense. And then it can become like a long-term problem, Mm. and, and then they're harder to treat. Um, so okay. be on the lookout for the fluid. Yeah, I mean, just, it's just something you want to yeah. be aware of. And, and it's the most common complication after tummy tuck, so, so it's good to know about it. Mm-hmm. It's good to know about all these complications yeah. because you're spotting them as well. I think it, too, it would give me less anxiety to, you know, know if I started to see this pocket of fluid, it's not, you know, it's probably this thing and I'm not going to catastrophize. And you already know, oh, I just have to go and get the fluid removed back to normal. Nothing that you're suddenly Googling your symptoms. And we all have done that before. Yeah. Like elbow pain equals Death. elbow yeah. cancer. You know? yeah. yeah. No, I, and that that is literally, I mean, you just hit the nail on the head. That's exactly what I want patients to gain from this podcast mm-hmm. or any videos that I make on YouTube, it's a it's about being prepared. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm personally a like worst case scenario person. So whatever I'm gonna do or, you know, who knows, whatever it is, like I would like to know what what can go bad here. Yeah. You know? And I, I'm not gonna wish that upon myself or I'm not gonna immediately be like, oh I'm not gonna do that because that could happen. But I'd like to know some idea What's the worst case scenario here? Mm-hmm. Oh, I can lose a limb. Okay, I'm probably not going to do that. But, you know, uh, oh, you, you're going to be late and here you're going to have to catch another flight or what? You know, okay, this is, mm-hmm. let me figure it out. So I think you need to go into surgery with that. Worst case scenario, and I mentioned the pulmonary embolus. So you, f- you figure out, okay, I understand. It's not common. This is how I prevent it. You know, mm-hmm. you, you come at it from a knowledge base. Yeah. And same thing with the seroma. Okay, I've, I, I, it's easier to hear about it before you have surgery yeah. than to be coming in and you're like, oh my God, I have this and now what do I do and how do we handle this and all that type of anxiety. Yeah. So that's exactly right. Um, okay, I'm going to go down my list. Hematoma. Mm-hmm. Hema- hematoma. Let's no, do I'm, it. I'm asking you. Oh, me? I know what it is. What do you do? What no. is it? <laughs> oh, you don't know what it is. Okay. So hematoma is a uh, collection of blood. And so... You, any type of surgery you have, we cut, right? Mm-hmm. When you cut, you go through blood vessels, you bleed. Mm-hmm. We stop the bleeding during the surgery with something called uh, electrocautery, which is just like a, a, an electrical instrument that has heat. And it cauterizes and causes the little vessels to mm-hmm. close. And even though you go through and you cauterize everything and there's no active bleeding, you can have like a little blood clot come off or something that was stopping the bleeding before. A little vessel maybe was in spasm. Now it opens up three hours after you leave the operating room, and you can bleed. Mm-hmm. And so you'll. It's very similar to a seroma in terms of you would have swelling, but this happens much closer to surgery. Seromas are usually a later presentation, like they can come up, you know, after the drains come out. So it's usually like maybe a week or two weeks mm-hmm. or three weeks after surgery you notice a seroma. Whereas a hematoma, this is going to happen in the immediate 
post-operative period, like within the first 24 hours, okay. usually less, you will, those patients will have pain because mm. they'll have swelling, they'll have pain, they'll have bruising, and it'll be pretty obvious. Like one side is a lot more swollen than the other side. Mm. And so the treatment for that is you have to go back to the operating room. We open up the incision. We evacuate the blood. We wash everything out. And the interesting thing about it is most of the time we never find what was actually bleeding. How? Because it, it resolves itself? Is that Yeah, it makes why? no sense, right? But it's, it's true. And, um, I mean, you would kind of expect, like, okay, you open up the wound, you get the blood clot out, and then you're going to see some little vessel like psh, psh, psh. But it, usually what happens is your body does not want to bleed. Mm -hmm. So your body naturally is activating the, the clotting system to stop the bleeding, and the vessels will you know, contract. So I would say most of the time if you have to go back for hematoma, which is not very common, but it certainly, it certainly happens to me. It happens to every mm -hmm. surgeon. Um, you usually just wash everything out, and then you look, and you're like, where is this little you know, bugger that's bleeding? And you usually can't find it. And wow, if you do, you, you can cauterize it. it or put a stitch in it or something. Um, and again, you know, that's not a life-threatening bleed. Mm -hmm. It's usually somewhat self-limited because there, it's a smaller space. And it, you know, as the bleeding starts to stretch, then the clot forms and it starts to put its own pressure on it. Okay. So that's really why it stops in addition to the other things. Okay, now let's talk about infection. And there's a couple different ways of, or a couple of different types of infection that okay. you can get. So um, you can get a pneumonia, mm -hmm. not common but you can get an ammonia because you have splinted breathing, you have more pain in your tummy, you're not taking a deep breath, you're not walking enough, you can develop a pneumonia. I can't really remember the last time I ever had a patient that had pneumonia from a tummy tuck. Okay. It's possible. You can get a bladder infection. That's, mm -hmm. that's possible because we put a catheter in the bladder. Okay. Every time you know we do it under sterile conditions, but no matter what, if you instrument any part mm -hmm. of the body, you can get an infection Sorry. there. Um, but more commonly, it would either be a wound infection, mm -hmm. which is usually appears as like hot, red, tender to the touch. That's, um, again, not particularly common, but it's fairly easy to treat. And the way we treat it is we open the wound. And the if you go back in time and I, and one of my old professors used to tell me bacteria don't like to copulate in public <laughs> and so it took me a little bit to kind of figure out what that meant when I was a, when a medical student but it just means that if the wound is closed there can be a little party and a little bacteria a little infection you open it now you've exposed those bacteria mm -hmm. to public and they don't want to copulate in public they don't want to replicate and it cures the infection so if you have a wound infection you open it and then you just pack it with gauze and wash with soap and water and your body just will heal it from the inside out. That is so interesting. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, I can't tell you the number of times that people want to do things for infection, mm -hmm. in like a wound infection. And it's just like, nope, all we have to do is open it. And sometimes, um, you know, Technically, would not even be required to give an antibiotic, which I know sounds like almost heresy to say that. But if you have just a pure, think of it this way, if you have like a boil, okay, and you, the treatment for that is to take a knife and to open it up and to let the pus out, then you keep it open by packing it, let your body heal it from the inside out, and mm -hmm. that's where it's going to heal. If you don't have any infection in your skin, if there's really no surrounding redness, you don't need an antibiotic because you've treated the infection with the knife and your body will take care of the rest. But if you have something else called cellulitis, which is an infection in the skin, there you can't really treat it with a knife because it's just a generalized you know, redness, almost looks like a rash, that you need an antibiotic for. So oh. if you just have some surrounding redness around the wound and it's just in the skin, you can treat that with an antibiotic and it'll get better. If you have some redness around your incision and then you can see like, oh, there's a little bit of pus in there, this 
then that's an actual wound infection. Mm -hmm. Then you need to open the wound and you need antibiotics to get rid of the infection that's in the surrounding skin. Okay. Okay. Is mm -hmm. that clear? No, to, it is. That's, it? I think I'm getting my medical degree while I'm sitting yeah, here, actually. I'll get my white coat after this episode. <laughs> I guess you guys will too. No, it is definitely clear. And I think what's super helpful about this is uh, just making very, defining very clear expectations for anybody yeah, just looking to explore this. Be prepared. Yeah, being prepared. And also, too, I think at first the words sound scary, but then when you explain it, it's, like in this case, it's a lot simpler. Yeah, I mean, with, with an infection after tummy tuck, you're not going to die. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, this is not a type of an infection where you, when you, you know, you could be in the hospital sure. with, with something significant. Um, these are usually all treatable with oral antibiotics mm -hmm. or um, a little procedure in the in the operating room or sometimes just in the in the examining room. Um, okay, this next one I want to touch on is something called a dog ear, and this is the yeah, oh I love dogs too. Yes. Um, but I'm, I'm I'm guessing we don't love them in this case. Yeah, the dog <laughs> ears are not something that. Um, I don't really view it as a complication the way it's the same thing like as an infection because this one is just more of a long term. You have some excess skin on the outside parts, the lateral parts okay. of your incision. And what happens is you're making an incision from you know the front coming around to the back and there's a transition. You have to stop the incision at some point, obviously. Mm -hmm. And we do when there's no more extra skin to remove Okay, from the tummy tuck but you can have a little transition between those two points that can give you a little bit of redundant skin. It's almost like if you kind of pinch your thumb and your index finger together and you get that little sort of bulged mm -hmm. area, like if that was the incision and it stops Here. this little swelling, yeah. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you can get that at the end of your incision and it, we just, we, we know that it can happen, which we do things during the initial surgery to try and avoid it, mm -hmm. but it's not always possible just depending on somebody's body. Mm -hmm. So you can have to have that revised where we just remove a little bit so of skin. So that's like an aesthetic. Yeah, exactly. Complication. Okay. Right. And so that's, that's a differentiation between some of the other ones that were mm -hmm. me more, more medical. Well, I think, uh, we should, uh, I mean, I'm asking so many questions here, so why don't we throw someone else's in? And let's take a quick pause for our bit. Okay, what let's, is it? Let's uh, head into What's Up, Doc? What's up, Doc? All right, Doc. Yes? Is J-plasma safe? And what is J-plasma? Okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> so, um, well, I mean, that's kind of a hot topic right now mm -hmm. because the FDA actually just issued a warning to surgeons that use it and patients that are scheduled to get it to you know, maybe push pause. Sounds great so far. Well, <laughs> I mean, I'm not particularly a, a fan of any uh, liposuction technique that uses thermal energy. So let me just kind of back up and explain. It I call it earth, wind, and fire in mm -hmm. terms of what's happened. So if you go and look at the history of liposuction, you know, it started off where we, we inject fluid to kind of distend the fat decrease the amount of bleeding because it's a little vasoconstrictive like epinephrine in there. And then you go through with a cannula and you remove, you know, it's a vacuum and that suction will remove the fat that after you've kind of blown it up with the fluid. And then the reason I call it earth, wind, and fire is that since that time, everybody's been trying to improve liposuction. And so they've added water techniques. So this hydro was very popular for a period of time where they were using water to break up the fat. And then there's been all types of heating elements. So there's been ultrasound and there's been lasers. And so there's been just a whole bunch of different things that have been marketed to say, hey, this is going to give you a better lipo result. The reality is we've really never seen better results with any of these other techniques. And I think they just produce more scarring and more fibrosis, and so that's why I don't like to use them. Mm -hmm. When patients ask me what type of lipo to use, I'm like, I use the old-fashioned lipo that's been around for decades. Yeah, if, it don't, if it's not broken, don't fix yeah, it. I mean, I, I think it. Yeah, I mean, I think it really is not broken, and, and everybody's trying to sort of look for a new avenue mm -hmm. that's going to, because remember, the holy grail that people always want is no downtime, mm -hmm. no recovery, no pain, no mess, and, you know, the same results as regular liposuction. 
And so, you know, it's been marketed to patients that way. Hey, do you want to have a procedure you can have over your lunch time and go back to work and things like that, which is just not real. I mean, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, that's kind of the thinking. And so I think some of these devices in, in the past have been sort of marketed along those lines for easier recovery and things. And, and so I, I've never, I've used some of them and I've just always gone back to regular liposuction. I just think it's, at least for me, when I operate, it's just mm -hmm. consistent. I can get consistently good, safe results. And um, J Plasma uses uh, some electrical energy and some helium. And I, I've used J Plasma before, but not as a plastic surgeon. I actually, when I first used J Plasma was years ago as a general surgeon. And um, it was a way we used to use it when we operated on the liver mm -hmm. because it was very, very strong at coagulating and the liver really bleeds easily. So it would generate a lot of heat and a lot of force and it was very good for cutting through and coagulating mm -hmm. something that bled very nicely. Um, but I didn't, uh, but I, I've never used it or seen an advantage to use it, you know, in a liposuction situation. Mm -hmm. The thinking is, that you can avoid a tummy tuck, for example, if you have loose skin and the, that technique, the J-plasmic technique will heat and cause the skin to contract and therefore you won't need a tummy tuck. That's kind of how it is in theory. I think that heat just creates more scarring, which creates mm. more fibrosis. And I think if you actually have excess skin, you need to have that skin removed with a tummy tuck rather than, but it appeals to patients that don't want a tummy tuck, so. So it's not that it's, unsafe it's just it has different complications it sounds like yeah. it's also not gonna I mean, the FDA, yield the same results that you obviously well for. yeah i'm yeah. i just i don't like those heat techniques yeah. but they're with j plasma now they're the fda just came out with that warning so i i you know i can't say anything other than the fact that that is the warning that yeah. that was there and just be well informed which we now are and yeah, no, all of these things are risk benefits to everything and talk, yeah. you know, talking with your surgeon and what, what they think. So, yeah, the I guess the scarring, you said the fibrosis, the heat has its own complications with the J-plasma. And um, I'm guessing there's some more that go on your list. Other yeah, there are more things. You want me to get back to the Let's list? Let's go right back into it. Okay, so, and again, this is kind of not a complications specific to tummy tuck, but mm -hmm. any time we take a knife and cut the skin, you're going to have numbness in the incision. Yeah. And so it, it bothers patients more after tummy tuck than I see, like for example, after a C-section. So, um, because C-section scar is kind of shorter mm -hmm. and I think it's um, just not as appreciated as much, but after you have a tummy tuck, patients can appreciate that they have some numbness above the incision line, sort of going up their abdomen. And that numbness never like fully goes away. No. I With my scar, I even hate touching it because it just feels so weird. I still have that, and that was over 10 years ago. Yeah, and it, in those nerve regeneration is just a whole nother topic. Mm -hmm. um, but what you describe is not uncommon. Mm -hmm. The way we actually treat any type of nerve, either if it's too sensitive or not sensitive enough, is actually to touch it. Uh, that's the last thing I do. Well, you know, if you had touched it, I mean, I'm not saying 100%, mm -hmm. but probably if you had, had practiced touch therapy, it's an actual thing. Really? Yeah. See, I wear my necklaces, jewelry, clothes can touch it, no problem. But if I, like, ever have to scratch my neck or run my you. finger, I just try not to it, it i don't know what it is it that makes your skin kind of crawl it's a weird weird yeah, unsettling it's, feeling it's, but it's not i'm not in discomfort all the time it's not dangerous right it's just it's a yeah. you notice it yeah and that's hyperparesthesia which which means that your nerves are giving you a sensation as if something more is happening than what's really happening there it's like a ghost touch yeah, yeah. it's some, something else <laughs> yeah. there so um the, but the way to, the way I have patients manage that at the beginning is by actually touching their scar and the tissue around it. I usually have patients go from an area of, like let's say it's on your breast. Mm -hmm. I have patients touch like their shoulder or their upper chest, an area that has normal sensation, go down through their breast, through the incision, and onto their tummy. So it's kind of like you're retraining your brain. 
So it's like, okay, this is normal. This is a light touch. I should not be overly uh, sensitive when I'm now touching my scar. And then I'm going back to my normal area in the abdomen. So by doing that little path, you're kind of, you know, training your brain to say like, oh, these, it, it should not feel that way. Is a touch therapy only truly effective immediately after or would that do anything for me now at this point? I, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe not. I think Just probably for, you have to do it at the <laughs> we'll beginning. See. For context, I, I, I haven't had plastic surgery before. I had a partial thyroidectomy mm -hmm. into uh, 2010. And so that's why I have this scar here. But yeah. It's, you it's, know, I didn't even notice that scar. Oh, so then. Pff, I did a better. really I had um, keloids. Or it was like really raised for a couple of years. And they were offering the steroid injections. Mm -hmm. And the as much as the idea of a needle going into my neck sounds joyous yes. i um declined declined yes <laughs> well it's it's healed nicely mm -hmm. um but with that skin numbness i'll tell you where i actually really kind of learned about it um was remember i told you a lot of my answers are long mm -hmm. all right so buckle up here <laughs> so um no well where i le where i learned about it is when i did my plastic surgery training at duke and Duke doesn't do it anymore, but when I was training there, they used to send their residents to Louisville, Kentucky for four months, and we would do nothing but hand surgery. And a lot of people don't realize that hand surgery is a part of plastic surgery. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a very world-famous center in Louisville called the Kleiner Coots Institute. And so we would go there and do nothing but hand surgery for four months. It's an amazing center. And I was working in... Uh, one of the clinics with one of the surgeons there. And, you know, hand surgery is the follow-up is very quick. You know, it's like you had a trigger finger, can you move? Great, scar's good, and they're gone. So you see a lot of patients quickly. And with some of the clinics, we'd see like 80 or 100 patients a day. And so when you see that really high volume, wow. you get exposed to so many different problems. It's such a great learning environment. So... We, I was working with this one surgeon who specialized in these upper extremity nerve problems. And we had a patient that came into the clinic and she was wearing a box, like a, like kind of like a shoe box mm -hmm. with a hole cut in one end mm -hmm. and her hand went into the box and then she had worked it into a sling. You're kidding me. No, so it looks obviously very bizarre. Somebody comes in with a box. And I will tell you that the the initial kind of, like, I heard you giggle, right? You're like, this sounds like a little crazy. Maybe this person's got some. But some I'm also thinking benefit of the doubt. Maybe they didn't have other r materials to fashion a sling. No, but I'll, I'll tell you why she was wearing that. And it, 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 it stuck with me. So... She was not crazy. There was no mental illness. She was a completely normal person. She was experiencing a type of reaction that can come after damage in the nerves in your finger. Her finger was so sensitive that even air, you know how you talked about your mm -hmm. rubbing your mm -hmm. neck here? Or even air blowing or on her finger caused her excruciating pain. And so I, you know, while most of the people in the clinic were like, oh, oh, you know, the surgeon that I worked with, he was, he's a really amazing person. Mm -hmm. And he explained to me, like, listen, you have to respect and understand what these patients are going through. And it may seem bizarre for somebody to come in with a box, but this is the only thing she's been able to do. And so his whole program with her was on nerve desensitization. And it really wasn't him as a surgeon doing anything. He had already explored other options with her in terms of aromas. And I'm not going to get into all that stuff. But there was really no surgical solution for her. Mm -hmm. But the people that really made progress with her were the occupational therapists who were the ones that w went into all the touch therapy. Wow. And that was their focus, was to uh, just baby steps to get her to remove the box and to get some type. And so she went through a lot of pain in order to desensitize what, desensitize what she had. And it, I, I kind of went with the occupational therapist. That was part of her education. And they had uh, a six, because you have to realize, like, there's a lot of obviously nerves and sensation in your hands, so this is an issue that comes up with hand surgery a lot. 
you know, just a small cut on whatever, Thanksgiving cutting something. Paper cut. Yeah, paper, paper cut cuts something. Paper cuts take me down all the time. You can develop some nerve problems. Mm -hmm. And so um, they developed this nerve sens desensitization where they took six different objects, something sharp, something blunt, something soft, something, you know, rough, and they would apply these different things to the nerve, to wow. the area. And so when I've had patients, because you, you can have patients, not to the same degree as that, that lady with the box, but you can have patients that have quite, not just a little bit of numbness, but they have pain with wow. their incision. And so I don't have an occupational therapist or mm -hmm. don't do anything, but I recommend they do this six different material touch. And it's helped a lot of people in terms of getting their scar, their incisions wow. and that's to be something much you better. Could I guess even do at home with all yeah, the different this touches. is all by yourself. This is okay. all by yourself. You don't need anybody to do it. You just So when I go home and I'm just rubbing my neck against things. Yeah, I'm, at this I'm point, actually being helpful. Okay. You may you may be a little bit late, but yeah, but if you it started, you know, <laughs> I would have mentioned that to you. Yeah, I wish someone had. Well, okay. So complication but nothing that's like I guess that one you could uh, essentially kind of Yeah, help most people can with, work through it and it's not a long-term issue occupational therapist for anything more severe but wow she comes in in a shoe box yeah i mean it was really it, it it's you realize how debilitating something like oh, that oh yeah be. yeah absolutely wow yeah i think she was lucky to have that surgeon or she probably just kept searching until she found yeah. somebody that really yeah. took her complaint legitimately yeah. and and helped her and that's actually a good point to make um on episodes we've talked about before is finding the right surgeon for you having those realistic expectations which we are giving to you guys now and setting you up for the best experience for these yeah. surgeries going into it yeah. with, with knowledge um, i want to touch on two other two other points here gabby one is and you talked about it a little bit with the scarring and again, this could be like a whole episode talking about keloids versus hypertrophic scars versus just scars that aren't that good. Mm -hmm. But it's in, you know, usually if you have a keloid, it's usually be, it's genetics, and mm -hmm. and there there's problems that are there, and you can you can treat them. But those they can resolve themselves though, right? Not usually, no. Oh. Yeah, the keloids are there, and um, but I, I, those are just. I, I just wanted to put them on the list. I don't really mm -hmm. want to go through and discuss them because they're pretty big topics. Mm -hmm. But there is a difference between a hypertrophic scar, uh, which is where the the incision is where it is the same kind of width as it was when it was originally made, and the scar is contained within that area where the incision was made, but the scar is just kind of beefed up and red and lumpy and not very attractive. Versus a keloid, which is a different entity in it totally, whereas a keloid is actually extends beyond where that incision was. So you start to develop new scarring adjacent to where you had the original. So that's why you'll see somebody can have like a little chicken box, you know, mm, scab or whatever that mm -hmm. they picked as a kid, and then they develop a keloid. But it's not contained within that little what was the original wound. It's much bigger, and it can blossom into... You know, I've seen keloids this massive, like they can take up most of the chest. Oh and my gosh. Yeah, different things like that. Is one of those types of scarring more common following? If that's a complication that follows the tummy tuck, is one more common? Yeah, the hypertrophic scarring okay. is more common than a, than a keloid. And usually patients that develop keloids will know beforehand if they have a history of keloids. And I, I, I can think of a patient right off the top of my head who... She, the patients that are more prone to developing keloids have more pigment naturally in their skin. So Asian uh, populations, uh, African-American patients, sub-Saharan kind of hyperpigmentation or, or you know, darker skin mm -hmm. are more likely to have keloids than our patients with lighter skin okay. colors. And um, that's not to say that somebody with lighter skin color can't develop a keloid because, you know, they can. Um, but... Um, you know, I can think of a patient who she came to see me for a breast lift and a tummy tuck and, you know, mommy makeover. And she had a lot of keloids all over her body. She was Asian and she and I said, you know, this is going to be a problem because I'm I, I'm I don't know if we should do it because I think you're going to have bad keloids mm -hmm. on, on your scars. 
And she she was a physician, and so she's like, yeah, I know I'm gonna have keloids. I mean, my mom has keloids, my sister had keloids, I have keloids. It's mm -hmm. just, but she's like, that's not gonna stop me because I want the shape. I want bigger breasts, and I want my breasts lifted, and I want to get rid of this extra skin. So she knew, and she ended up developing a keloid on her tummy. Um, and but she knew that going in. So you know that's part of being prepared. But mm -hmm. but um, if you do have a keloid, you're higher risk of developing a keloid. It's just something we can't predict. You sure. can have a keloid on your back, and then you do, do, do a tummy tuck, and you don't have any keloid at all. Wow. So it's it's unpredictable. Okay, final thing uh, I want to talk about is just the belly button. Because, you know, if you have a problem with your belly button, then that can really kind of take away from the, the aesthetic results, obviously. What kind of, what would be considered a problem? So it ranges, again, just like all of these complications from you can lose your belly button, Mm -hmm. So that doesn't happen particularly often, but it's possible. And um, because, again, it's blood supply related and we have to go through and cut around the belly button and in, we leave a wider stock to protect the blood supply there. But you can imagine if you leave a wider stock on, you know, 100 patients, you could have one patient that even though we've left a wide stock, the blood supply to that belly button can be two millimeters away instead of just having that adequate stock which normally ensures good blood supply for every patient in that one person it can be inadequate and then they can have loss of their belly button so that's you know it's kind of the but worst that's not dangerous is it? it's not it's dangerous just but it's yeah, you don't have a belly button yeah there's nothing dangerous really any of the problems with the belly yeah. button are not dangerous but you know we you, we don't want to do a tummy tuck and then you lose your yeah your belly button um, and then, but that's not very common, mm -hmm. but what's more common is for, you know, just changes in the shape of your belly button where your belly button is not as open as it should be. Um, that's why when I do my tummy tucks, I try and really pull everything towards the outside. So the abdomen is nice and flat. Mm -hmm. Um, but something that happens quite often, and this is really not a complication it's something to know, but I do think people think of it as a complication, your belly button can be off center. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's there's more people probably that have a belly button that's off center than people do, that have it centered because we're all asymmetric and yeah. crooked and yeah. it's hard to draw straight lines on people. So you can have your belly button where it's shifted a little bit to mm -hmm. the side. So if I see somebody before they have a tummy tuck and I'm marking them and I notice their belly button's one side or the other, I always point it out to them because a lot of times when you have a tummy tuck, you have... A lot of skin and it may be draping over the belly button so you don't really see if your belly button where it is lined up good point i didn't even think about yeah that. something that doesn't come up so no not at all well, um, that's my list well guys if there's something that you have questions about regu regarding these complications or ones that we didn't mention that you're worried about comment let yeah, us know please, we, can, we will circle back we will answer your questions i will ask them because I'm dying to know too. I've learned so much today about this. Oh, good. I'm glad. And um, since you've reached the end of your list, do you know what that means? Uh, yeah, that means it's wheel time. Time for the wheel. Bring her out. Everyone say hello to the OG wheel. Okay, I'm hoping for OG Chef today. Oh, you are? Yeah. And I'm sure you guys are hoping for the $250 giveaway. Let's see. What do you spin the wheel, Gabby? You know, what are you what do I for? want? Yeah. What do you want? Um, same as always. Anything but uh, TikTok. <laughs> TikTok dancing. <laughs> All right. Not that I don't like TikTok. I love TikTok. Just watching them, not making them. Yes, exactly. Well, let's find out. Let's do it. Beauty pageant. A oh, beauty pageant. Okay. Do you ever look at someone and wonder what is I do going like on inside their head? <laughs> You know what I, we should do what? is have you put on like a pageant uh, gown tiara for these. and stuff like that. We should yeah. dress you up for these. Yeah. Something to know. We'll we'll get some. I feel uh, that I don't do well on these questions. And you know what? I feel like I enjoy these the most. <laughs> yeah. All, <laughs> all right, right. Let's try all right. Again. All right. Here we go. Here we go. Mm -mm. What have been the world's greatest inventions, and why? <laughs> why these are developed? <laughs> 
Good thing I was never in one. Um, world's greatest inventions and why. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to go with the standard ones. Don't do it. No. Make it fun. Keep I'm not going to talk about sanita- sanitation. No. No. I'm not going to talk about vaccines. We're no. not going to talk about light. No. Electricity. Or electricity. That's what I meant. No. You know what the world's greatest invention has been? <laughs> Birth control? <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, it's been the iPhone. The iPhone, yeah. That okay. is the world's greatest invention. Yeah. Yeah, that has absolutely revolutionized and changed everything. I'm going with... iPhone? iPhone. Final All right. Answer. We're going with technology. Let's... let's I lined out. up for the first iPhone 2007. Did you really? Uh-huh. Yep. You're cool. I still have the first <laughs> iPhone. <laughs> Do you it doesn't work. Yeah, that doesn't um, work. I think there is there are a lot of invention. Lo- there are a lot of uh, great invention, but um, I think uh, transports are a great invention because it cr- it's um, enable to to it creates communication between between countries and. Yeah, it's a good way to, to discover iPhone. other I, countries. I think I nailed it. And <laughs> I think you did. Yeah. Well, she, you know what? I'm Thank gonna. You. She said communication. Mm-hmm. iPhone facilitates communication, mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. double win. Mm-hmm. I, I'm gonna give it to both of you. We're gonna help our girl out because. Um, well, I think she really she just more focused on the transport, though. Yeah. I, I lost kind of track, to be honest with <laughs> Me you. Me too. That was a little bit of a wandering answer. It's okay. Maybe that no. wasn't her shining moment. Like some of my answers, I I well, wander she looks sometimes. Beautiful. You wander. Do you think so? It's my answers? No. No? I mean, I'm entertained, with, so I don't mind. Okay, good. I like to wander, too. Yeah, I do. Some, a lot of my answers are long. We're going to need some more of these questions. You keep landing on beauty pageant. Yeah. <laughs> well, until that time comes, guys, make sure to like, comment, subscribe, follow. What else can you like? Did I hit all uh, of Turn them? on notifications. Turn on the notifications. Yeah. Um, hang out with us yeah. virtually. Mm-hmm. I don't know if we can add more things to do. We will and we'll let you know. But thanks for joining us. The more you know, the better you look. Bye, guys. Till next time. Dr. William, thank you. That was great. That was fun. Thank you. Bye-bye.